Welcome to this module on gastrointestinal emergencies, including initial workup and treatment options. I'm excited to get started with you guys. Welcome to the master course on urgent care brought to you by Cruza. While seeing patients with vomiting and diarrhea on a day-to-day -day basis can become a little bit monotonous and tiresome, gastrointestinal emergencies are actually one of my favorite types of cases to work up. The reason for this is a little multifaceted. A, there's a fairly straightforward workup algorithm that can be followed for the majority of vomiting and diarrhea patients. B, these cases can be incredibly rewarding to treat, as oftentimes they need just a little bit of supportive care and TLC to get them back home with their families and living life to the fullest again. Let's start with the vomiting patient by briefly reviewing the pathophysiology of vomiting. The vomiting reflex is mediated by the vomiting center in the medulla. Vagal and sympathetic afferent pathways from the stomach and intestines transmit signals to the vomiting center when stimulated by inflammation or overdistension of the gastrointestinal tract. Signals from within the brain, such as the vestibular system, cerebrum, and chemoreceptive trigger zone also stimulate the vomiting center. We want to differentiate vomiting from regurgitation anytime we have a patient with vomiting come in is these two conditions can sometimes be easily misinterpreted by owners. Vomiting is the forceful ejection of upper GI tract contents and may occur as a result of gastric, intestinal, or systemic disease, where regurgitation is the passive ejection of food, water, or saliva associated with esophageal and or pharyngeal disease, as well as some gastrointestinal disease states like GI stasis. To differentiate between the two, we want to ask the owner if there was the presence of active abdominal contractions and if there was any evidence of bile inside the vomitus. If so, you have a vomiting patient. Regurgitation is more of a passive process where animals may arch and stretch their neck and look like they're vomiting, but have no active abdominal contraction and typically bring up fluid or water in large to small volumes. Unfortunately, drooling can be seen in both of these patient populations and is not a sensitive marker for distinguishing between the two. Once we have clarified whether a patient is actually having vomiting or regurgitation, we can proceed with isolating differentials and creating a diagnostic plan for each one. Regurgitation differentials include pharyngeal disease, esophageal disease, inflammation of the esophagus or esophagitis, and mechanical obstruction. Esophageal diseases include hypomotility, megaesophagus, myasthenia gravis, generalized neuromuscular disease, hypoadrenocorticism, and dysautonomia. Mechanical obstruction might be due to esophageal foreign body or stricture or GI stasis leading to a recurrent mechanical obstruction, vascular ring anomalies, or hiatal hernias. Vomiting differentials are a little different and include obstruction, dietary, infectious, extra GI systemic, which encompasses pancreatitis, uremic gastritis, gastrointestinal ulceration, drug therapy, diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoadrenocorticism, and vestibular disease, to name just a few. The workup for regurgitation and vomiting can look similar, but also very different. The primary diagnostic tool for the workup of regurgitation is a thoracic radiograph to rule out esophageal dilation, mediastinal masses or congenital abnormalities, and to look for common side effects of regurgitation, including aspiration pneumonia. Pending the case, i.e. if vomiting plus regurgitation is present, abdominal radiographs and or an abdominal ultrasound may also be recommended for the regurgitating patient. Abdominal ultrasound is less commonly used for patients with just regurgitation, however, it can be helpful in ruling out GI stasis, particularly if the patient has been recently hospitalized on stasis-inducing medications such as opioids. If myasthenia is suspected, serum can be submitted for an acetylcholine receptor antibody assay. Consideration may also be given to ACTH stimulation testing to rule out hypodrenocorticism, and if fluoroscopy is available, a swallow study to rule out esophageal strictures or congenital abnormalities can be performed. 
For vomiting, abdominal radiographs plus or minus an abdominal ultrasound are vitally important to rule out gastrointestinal obstruction, space occupying abdominal masses, pancreatitis, ureteral obstruction or renal dysplasia leading to uremic gastritis, and gastric and intestinal wall thickness and layering abnormalities. Again, just to name a few. Thoracic radiographs should also be considered in the vomiting patient. In addition to diagnostic imaging, complete blood work and urinalysis are strongly recommended in the vomiting patient. Just like with our diagnostics, treatment for the vomiting and regurgitating patient can look very similar, but also very different. The necessity of treatment for a regurgitating patient often depends on severity and duration of clinical signs and the suspected underlying disease processes that are happening. Any patient with chronic regurgitation and possible changes to appetite or decreased water intake should be assessed for dehydration. If dehydration is present, consideration can be given to hospitalization and intravenous fluid therapy. However, this is often not completely necessary for these cases. Esophagitis from regurgitation is secondary to abnormal mucosal exposure to activated pepsin-containing gastric contents, particularly when the gastric pH is less than four, because the proteolytic pH range for the conversion of pepsinogen to pepsin is between one and a half and three and a half. Based on this, if esophagitis is suspected, treatment with the histamine to receptor antagonists like famotidine or proton pump inhibitor like pantoprazole or esomeprazole is indicated. Pantoprazole and esomeprazole are the injectable versions of omeprazole. If active esophageal ulceration is suspected, i.e. if the patient is having regurgitation with frank blood in it, you can consider the addition of sucralfate as well to coat the lining of the esophagus. A topic of great debate is the use of prokinetic agents like the 5-HT4 receptor agonists metoclopramide and cisapride in patients with chronic regurgitation. This is because the esophagus is composed of primarily striated muscle and these medications act primarily on smooth muscle. The concern exists that these medications will act at the lower esophageal sphincter and constrict it, which can cause worsening of the regurgitation particularly if marked esophageal dilation, like in patients with megaesophagus, is present. In a subset of patients with megaesophagus, sildenafil, a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, has been shown to be effective in controlling regurgitation. The most important part of treatment is appropriate workup to diagnose the underlying cause and initiate treatment for that cause specifically. The treatment for vomiting, apart from regurgitation, is twofold. One, the focus is on controlling the vomiting itself to improve patient comfort and decrease fluid losses, and two, to treat the underlying cause of the vomiting. The type of antiemetic chosen for a patient depends on the severity of vomiting and the underlying cause for clinical signs, as the most common anti-nausea, anti-vomiting medications have different mechanisms of action. We're all pretty familiar with Serenia, right? Its mechanism of action is NK1 receptor antagonism, acting directly at that chemotactic trigger zone that we previously talked about. Therefore, if you have a patient with acute severe vomiting associated with toxin or foreign material ingestion, Serenia is a first line choice. However, if your patient has intermittent vomiting associated with an underlying disease process, let's say chronic kidney disease, for example, and they exhibit active signs of nausea, like continuous hypersalivation and abdominal tucking, a medication like Ondansetron, a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, would be beneficial. There's also a benefit to multimodal therapeutic use of both of these medications in an urgent and emergent care setting. Just to add a little note on antiemetics in the suspected foreign body ingestion patient. Vomiting due to suspected foreign body ingesta is one of the most common outpatient cases we see. If the owner either declines workup for a suspected foreign material ingestion or there is radiographic evidence of a suspected foreign body and the owner elects outpatient therapy regardless, you may want to select a shorter acting antiemetic like on Dancitron, which lasts only six to eight hours, versus Serenia, which lasts 24 hours, because Serenia can mask the signs of continued vomiting in these patients. 
If a patient is admitted for further workup, such as an abdominal ultrasound, the use of Serenia can be effective in controlling clinical signs and making these patients more comfortable until we have more information about what our next steps are going to be. Now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about vomiting and regurgitation, let's shift our focus and talk about diarrhea. We can break down diarrhea into two classifications based on the pathophysiologic mechanism causing the diarrhea. These include osmotic and secretory. Take a peek at the screen and see if you can pair up the classification of diarrhea with its mechanism of action. If you selected the following options, you're right on track to becoming a diarrhea expert. I know that's what you've always wanted. Osmotic diarrhea means the presence of excessive luminal osmols drawing fluid into the intestinal lumen. Secretory diarrhea means a net increase in intestinal fluid secretion, which can further then be broken down into absolute increase in intestinal secretion or relative increase secondary to decreased absorption. So you're either secreting too much or you just can't absorb it. We can add a couple of other classifications in as well. Diarrhea can result from altered permeability and diarrhea can result from deranged motility. Altered permeability can be secondary to mechanical and or inflammatory disruption of the intestinal mucosa leading to microscopic and macroscopic damage to the epithelial cells or epithelial junction causing loss of vital nutrients into the intestinal lumen, as well as increasing the risk for bacterial translocation from the intestines into the bloodstream. Alterations in motility is the least understood mechanism of diarrhea and can be due to either increased peristaltic contractions or decreased segmental contractions within the intestinal wall. There is definitely a significant overlap between these groups. Causes of diarrhea, believe it or not, are wide and varied and include iatrogenic secondary to medications, so gastroprotectants, antibiotics, chemotherapeutics, immunomodulatory medications, and NSAIDs, infectious processes, so parasitic, bacterial, viral, fungal, and protozoal, inflammatory immune-mediated causes, such as IBD, associated with loss of local immune tolerance to normal dietary and bacterial components, protein-losing enteropathies, neoplasia, and then extra gas gastrointestinal diseases and then extra gastrointestinal diseases such as disease in the hepatobiliary system, pancreas, endocrine system, or other miscellaneous abnormalities. As you can imagine, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, and expanding upon each one of these is outside the scope of this urgent care series. Diagnostic workup for a patient with diarrhea is highly dependent on historical, clinical pathologic, and physical examination findings. In general, consideration should be given to complete blood work, including a complete blood count, a full chemistry panel, electrolytes, a urinalysis to help differentiate between GI and non-GI causes. Results of full blood work then may trigger testing for things like hyperthyroidism, hypoadrenocorticism, liver disease, or neoplasia. Infectious disease testing, including but not limited to fecal flotation, fecal PCR, direct cytologic examination of the stool, parvovirus and giardia testing can also be considered. Say an owner recently opened a new bag of food and both dogs in the house are having severe acute diarrhea. You may want to consider a fecal bacterial culture in these dogs to rule out Salmonella, Campylobacter, and Enteropathogenic E. coli. If a young German Shepherd presents to the door with a history of unthriftiness, weight loss, and diarrhea, Consideration should be given to trypsin-like immunoreactivity testing to rule out exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. If a patient has severe acute hematochesia or frank blood in the stool, in addition to the above testing, you may also want to consider coagulation testing to rule out toxin ingestion. Just like with vomiting and regurgitation, treatment is focused on controlling and replacing fluid and electrolyte losses followed by treating the underlying cause of the diarrhea pending the results of your diagnostics. It is not uncommon for patients to have severe fluid loss leading to dehydration and electrolyte disturbances that require hospitalization with intravenous fluid therapy while diagnostics are being carried out. The use of antibiotics in patients with diarrhea is considered controversial. 
and should only be considered if evidence of bacterial infection or bacterial overload exists or if there is suspected contaminated food ingestion. As studies have shown that the routine use of empiric antibiotics does not significantly affect outcome, even in patients with acute hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Pre and probiotic supplementation is becoming more popular in human and veterinary medicine with specific indications for use, including antibiotic associated diarrhea and diarrhea resulting from disruption to the normal GI flora. This concludes our module on gastrointestinal emergencies. Please proceed to the next module when you're ready. Thank you.